I think what I want to talk about is where we're heading now, which is where we end up when we've concluded effectively that God is dead or that Christianity is dead or that any faith in anything transcendent is dead. I want to talk about what we're creating in the place of the religion we used to have. So I'll start with some, um, well, I'll start with some words from the book of Genesis, shall I? Because it's the obvious place to start, isn't it? God formed out of dust from the ground and breathed in his face the breath of life and man became a living soul. Then the Lord God took the man he formed and put him in the garden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded Adam saying, you may eat food from every tree in the garden. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat. For in whatever day you eat from it, you shall die by death. Now, the serpent was more cunning than all the wild animals the Lord God made on the earth. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not die by death. For God knows in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods, knowing good and evil. So she took its fruit and ate. And then to Adam, God said, cursed is the ground in your labours. In toil, you shall eat from it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground from which you were taken. So that's a very abridged version of Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 and the story that begins there, the creation myth, really of the whole of Western culture, whether we like it or not, whether we're Christian or not. That story continues throughout the rest of the entire Bible, and it continues from the book of Acts until our own time. It's told daily. It's a story of humanity's rebellion against God, the fundamental heart of the matter. It's a story of how we begin in communion with creator and creation, and then we break that communion through a desire for knowledge, through a desire for power, through a desire to be like gods, as the serpent tells us we can be. And we choose to go our own way. We choose to build our own world, and the result of that is that we have to leave the garden. We have to come here, and we have to be laborers. So what do we do then? Well, the story continues. We have two choices, don't we? We can seek to return home to the garden, back to the communion. That's the story that Christ gives us, the way back. Or we can continue on the path we chose to walk when we first ate the fruit, which is the pursuit of of knowledge, the pursuit of power, the attempt to become gods ourselves. As the serpent says, you will be like gods if you eat this fruit. So what does that path look like, the path of trying to be like gods? Well, we start to see it manifesting in Genesis 4, I think, where we meet Cain, son of Adam and Eve. Cain, the first murderer. Cain, the builder of the first civilization. Cain is the first tiller of the soil. He's the first farmer. And he builds the first city. And his descendant, Tubal Cain, is the first smith, the first metal worker. And maybe then the creator of the first weapons. So Cain, in other words, is the father of technological civilization, the one we live in now. And the way of Cain is the rejection of the way of nature, the rejection of God, the rejection of that communi communion and community, if you like. And Cain's journey leads us into this darkness. The darkness of the self, the pride, the desire for control, the desire to be like gods. So how, how can a human be like God? How could a human be like a god? Well, perhaps the answer is doing what a god does. What does a god do? God creates. So we create. Like Tubal Cain created through the fire of technology. It's technology that raises us above the rest of creation and gives us the power, the power that we have now to destroy the rest of creation. Technology which blinds our eyes and deludes us that we are like gods. That tells us that rather than living humbly with our natural inheritance, as the serpent tells us, we can go further and faster and deeper into the rebellion, which manifests in the technological civilization we create to make ourselves powerful, godlike 
beings. And I want to suggest that the civilization we're living in today, which is on the verge of remaking nature, abolishing humanity, and unleashing technological changes which are unprecedented in history, that this civilization is the end point, the inevitable end point of the rebellion that began at the beginning of the biblical story and the rebellion that continued to the modern scientific project, the project of the Enlightenment, the project that Nietzsche was talking about so clearly there, and with honesty too. Now we can see this if we want to look very briefly at the history of the Western project, the modern Western project. Since the Enlightenment of the 18th century, which you could argue is a further stage in the rebellion, we haven't followed this path of humility and communion. We followed one of the notion, we followed the notion of one of the founders of modern science, Francis Bacon, who believed that the aim of the whole scientific project was, and I quote, to let the human race recover that right over nature which belongs to it by divine bequest. Now, Bacon believed, and he said, Bacon's kind of astringent honesty is quite close to Nietzsche's, actually. He's very clear about what he wants to do. Um, he believed that humanity should pin creation to a table and dissect it in pursuit of its dominion, and he was able to convince himself that this was what God wanted. This was part of the project of us having the dominion over creation which we were offered in the, in the garden. The English Orthodox theologian Philip Sherrard had a rather different view. In his book, The Rape of Man and Nature, which is a deep critique of the modern project and the scientific project from an Orthodox Christian point of view, he wrote this. The mechanistic nature of modern is marked by a desire to dominate, to master and possess and exploit nature, not to transform it or to hallow it. Modern science presupposes a radical reshaping of our whole mental outlook. It involves a new approach to being, a new approach to nature, in short, a new philosophy. We've tended to take it for granted that it represents a great breakthrough, a marvelous advance on the part of mankind, even a sign of our coming of age. But now that we begin to see the consequences of our capitulation to it, we are not so sure. Even so, it's difficult for us to admit that far from being an advance, the whole modern scientific project may be a ghastly failure. But there's no reason why it should not be. One has to judge things by their fruits. And one of the fruits of modern science, clear for all to see and implicit in the philosophy on which it is based, is the dehumanization both of man and of the society that he has built in its name. One has to judge things by their fruits. Well, we could look at the fruit of modern technological civilization and we could see the changing climate and we could see the highest extinction rate for 60 million years and we could see the oceans full of plastic and we could see half the world's forests destroyed and we can start to say to ourselves, I wonder if this is really the right direction for us to be going in. Is this stuff a, an unfortunate outgrowth of the project? Or is it right at the heart of it? We can argue that technological civilization and the scientific way of seeing and measuring, which is at the heart of it, is the new basis for our morality now that we have abolished God. Maybe even a new theology. And what's the fruit of the scientific way of seeing that Bacon pioneered? It's technology. The tools and the weapons and the machines and the techniques that we use to control nature and to further our dominion and power. So what is this technology? Well, what it's not is simply a value-neutral collection of tools or machines that we use to do our work for us. It's much more than that. And especially with the coming of the digital age, which we now live in, probably the most revolutionary age in history, technology has become something else. It's become an interconnected network of evolving and self-regulating digital intelligences which are being specifically designed by their creators to transform the world. Silicon Valley philosopher Kevin Kelly calls this network the Technium, and he believes it's entirely new in history, and he describes it like this. After 10,000 years of slow evolution and 200 years of incredible, intricate exfoliation, the Technium is maturing into its own thing. Its sustaining network of self-reinforcing processes and parts have given it a noticeable measure of autonomy. It may once have been as simple as an old computer program, merely parroting what we told it, but now it's more like a very complex organism that follows its own urges. 
Now, what Kelly's arguing there and what many other people in Silicon Valley who create our new reality to for us are arguing too is that we're creating something which is bigger than us. That we've created a network of technologies which are now controlling us, which we are now subject to, and which are moving so fast that we can barely keep up with what they're doing. There are plenty of examples of this. And the last two years during the COVID pandemic have given us an excellent example of the acceleration of those technologies. And whatever you think of the responses to the pandemic, there's no doubt that the technologies used to tackle it and their interconnected nature were unprecedented in scale and scope. Simply having to scan a code on your phone in a public place to confirm that you've received a vaccine so that you're allowed to have access to that place is, as I say, whatever you think of the justification for that, entirely unprecedented. We couldn't even have done something like that five or ten years ago, even if we'd wanted to. And it's had the effect of normalising that kind of approach to technology and the kind of network of control that's developed around it. And there's much more of it to come. Give you a few examples. The World Health Organization is currently negotiating with nation states to agree on the standards for global harmonization of digital passports. That's likely to lead to the creation of a global health passport, also on the agenda, which will then merge with existing digital ID technologies and the rollout of digital currency to create for us all a personalized digital identity wallet, which will be presented as an optional convenience, but soon enough may become a basic requirement for taking part in the life of society, just as smartphones and credit cards and passports effectively have. Very difficult to do anything without them now. Now, once we've accepted this level of control, this level of technological interconnection, and we seem to have done that already, then almost anything is possible. The technium moves very fast, faster than us. Media outlets last year were already producing slick little films detailing how your COVID passport could be conveniently stored on a microchip embedded in your skin, which was happening, particularly in parts of Scandinavia. Now in the US, the Food and Drug Administration has approved pills implanted with digital ingestion tracking systems, which send a signal to a smartphone when you take your medicine, so your doctor can check whether you've taken your medicine or not. And perhaps you'll be able eventually to pay for these with your biometric cash card imprinted with your fingerprint data and embedded under your skin. And if that sounds ludicrous, Consider a quote from a recent news story I found on the BBC News website just a couple of years ago, a couple of weeks ago, sorry, about a firm, a new company in Britain, which is creating implantable payment chips. When it comes to implantable payment chips, British-Polish firm Walletmore says that last year it became the first company to offer them for sale. This implant can be used to pay for a drink on the beach in Rio, a coffee in New York, a haircut in Paris, or at your local grocery store, says the founder and chief executive. It can be used wherever contactless payments are accepted. Walletmore's chip, which weighs less than a gram and is little bigger than a grain of rice, is composed of a tiny microchip and an antenna encased in a biopolymer, a naturally sourced material similar to plastic. Now, for the uh, biblical scholars amongst you, and since I started with the first book of the Bible, you might be interested to know, of course, that in the last book of the Bible, we do learn, don't we, about uh, where this little chip's going to be implanted. Any guesses about where the chip, without which you may not be able to buy or sell, is implanted? Right there in your right hand. So uh, enjoy that fact. Um, sometimes I wonder whether these are prophecies coming true, or people who know the prophecies who thought they'd just do this as a bit of a joke. Either way, the prophecy comes true. Now, perhaps this sounds like a terrible thing to you. It certainly does to me. But a 2021 survey of more than 4,000 people across the EU found that over 50% would already happily consider the implantable payment chip. And I'm sure that as it's marketed heavily in coming years, these numbers will rise. So this is the future plan. This is already happening. This is not a conspiracy theory. It's all out there and everybody's very happy to talk about it. Now, these are the coming times and they're herding us directly towards what is called the Internet of Bodies, in which we begin to merge finally with the machines we have made. Microchip brain implants are next on the horizon. Human enhancements, which will help us to interface directly with the web. Uh, a development which is being funded by, amongst others, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. Now, the Royal Society, Britain's premier scientific think tank, is very excited about the human brain inter uh, interface. And I will uh, just read you a short paragraph they produced recently. Uh, as they wrote about the possibilities on offer here. These are the, the most um, 
serious and well-respected scientists in Britain, linking human brains to computers using the power of artificial intelligence could enable people to merge the decision-making capacity and emotional intelligence of humans with the big data processing power of computers, creating a new and collaborative form of intelligence. People could become telepathic to some degree, able to converse not only without speaking but without words through access to each other's thoughts. Doesn't that sound great? Not only thoughts, but experiences could be communicated from brain to brain, says the Royal Society. What could possibly go wrong? You know, sometimes I think that most of our leading lights in science and technology have read all of the dystopian fiction that's been written in the last hundred years, but instead of seeing it as a warning, they thought it was a guidebook. So they, they watched The Matrix. Have anyone seen The Matrix? Um, they think that Agent Smith was the hero. Anyway, what we're looking at here is the advent of transhumanism. This is a movement described by the Guardian newspaper in the UK recently as a movement that aims to address or end the tragedies of reality. Same tragedies Nietzsche was talking about, actually. The tragedies of reality, ageing, sickness and involuntary death. Ageing, sickness and involuntary death. This phrase comes from an interview with a transhumanist writer, a scientist called Elise Bohan, whose new book, out now, is about the need to make us more than human and offer us something better than our human minds and bodies. Now, Bohan explains in this interview how she's looking forward to the development of artificial wombs so that women can avoid the pain of childbirth and the inconvenience of motherhood. She also explains how she would prefer it if nations were run not by human politicians but by computers, which may be the only point on which I agree with her. <laughs> Couldn't do a worse job, to be fair. Um, most of all, though, she explains how urgent it is that humans enhance their bodies with digital technologies to stave off death and ageing. I'll give you a quick quote, a couple of quick quotes from the interview, in which she explains the importance of using technology to conquer death. Humans, she says, could go on in a state of robust bust health, could keep learning. You'd have this cumulative effect where our experiences and knowledge would accumulate much faster. The things that our species could do with that, the mysteries of the universe we could unlock, the problems we could solve, and the depths of each other's souls that we could explore. Soul, she admits, is a loaded word, but without an alternative vocabulary for what makes consciousness, she's not averse to using spiritual language. Good to hear. Is transhumanism encroaching on domains that religion has traditionally held, she asks herself. I think yes, and then she tells a story. When she was a PhD student, she gave her first big paper at a conference. Afterwards, a biologist came up to her and congratulated her on her work. Then he looked me in the eyes, she said, and whispered to me, we're building God, you know. She chuckles, and I looked back at him and said, yeah, I know. Building God. Okay, this is transhumanism, and Elise Bohan, amongst others, is quite explicit about what she wants to do. And this is not some far-out, wacky thing. This is the mindset of Silicon Valley. And the people in Silicon Valley create our reality. Every time you take your smartphone out of your pocket and you look at it, you're not just being monitored and tracked and sold a load of stuff, of course you are, but you're seeing through literally a lens that has been created for you by people with this mindset. The people who design our world for us daily. Facebook's metaverse, Google's ongoing project to create a conscious artificial intelligence, the internet of bodies, technological telepathy, and hovering over all of it, this great transhumanist impulse, so well articulated here by Elise Bohan. Conquer death, remake life, become God. Remember that little story from the Garden of Eden? What do we do there? Choose knowledge and power so that we can become gods, we are told by the serpent. C.S. Lewis called this the abolition of man, and we're right on the brink of it here. And we can see the final end point of this project in a recent interview I came across with an influential Silicon Valley transhumanist with the delicious name of Zoltan Istvan. <laughs> Do you think his parents called him Zoltan, or did he change his name later on? Sounds like something out of Flash Gordon. Zoltan Istvan paints a picture of the future as a literal civil war between humans and artificial intelligences. We're in Terminator territory here. A prospect which, by the way, he's looking forward to. So Zoltan says this. Those humans who join the AI and merge their brains directly with machines won't work, but will live in virtual worlds freely. Those humans who don't merge with AI will have companies whose primary goal is to keep AI 
out of the lives of the rest of the humans left on the planet. A conflict of who merges with AI and who doesn't is coming. It will be a civil war of sorts. Ultimately, people won't be able to stop progress, and most humans will upload themselves into new worlds where they don't die, don't have to work, or live as biological beings who suffer. Communication will only be through thoughts. There we are again. Nothing else will exist for those who are uploaded into the cloud or live in quantum intelligence enclaves. There will be no eating, no breathing, no drinking, no using the bathroom, so there is that. The flesh will be gone, paving the way for the exploration of how intelligent we can become. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? It's very interesting to look at the impulse behind this, the desire, the, the entirely human desire to live without suffering. And the fact that, as I say, without any kind of religious worldview, without any transcendent worldview, without anything higher at all, the only way that you will inevitably be led into that is the abolition of biology itself. If biology, if nature makes us suffer, then the way to end suffering is to end nature. People like Zoltan Istvam and, and Elise Bohan and Mark Zuckerberg and Ray Kurzweil, who is Google's chief engineer, these people are creating our future. As I say, these are not marginal people. They design the technology you use all the time. They're highly influential and extremely wealthy. Now, I've wondered for many years why people like that are so excited about this vision and why I consider it to be a nightmare, why people like Zoltan Isfan see this as heaven. I think it's hell. He probably sees my idea of heaven as a hell as well. And I think this is the key here. When he talks about a civil war, he's talking about this clash of worldviews. And he's right, really. I think we need to understand that this transhumanist movement, which is where we are headed, is the logical endpoint of the scientific technological machine we've created. It's not really a technological issue. It's a religious phenomenon. Now, some transhumanists, to their credit, are very open about this. Billionaire CEO Martine Rothblatt, for example, very interesting character, she's quite open about what she is ultimately in pursuit of. And all of the rest of them will talk happily about this as well. Immortality, through the uploading of the human mind into the digital cloud. It's a technological version of the Christian story. Right? We're going to upload our souls into a digital heaven, only this time we're going to make it ourselves because we don't believe in anything else. And by the way, according to Martin Rothblatt, anyone who doesn't like this is, uh, is not somebody with an intellectual objection. They're prejudiced. It's a new prejudice she's invented called fleshism. Fleshism is the prejudice against people who don't have flesh. So I don't want to hear any fleshism from any of you. So one way to overcome your fleshism is to follow Martin Rothblatt's new religion, which he's kindly invented for us, a trans religion, it's called. Uh, it's got a name, it's called Terrasem, and it's a global religion. You can be in other religions too. You can be a Christian and an atheist or a Buddhist and still be part of this global, very inclusive trans religion for all of us who want to achieve digital transcendence. Uh, Terrasem is described like this. We are a trans religion that believes we can live joyfully forever if we build mind files for ourselves. We insist on respecting diversity, of course, without sacrificing unity, as well as pouring maximum resources into cyber consciousness software, geoethical nanotechnology, and space settlement. I don't know why you need the space settlement if your mind is in a digital cloud, but maybe Martine could explain it. The four core beliefs of Terrasem laid out helpfully on the new Global Religions website are as follows. Number one, life is purposeful. Number two, death is optional. Number three, God is technological. Number four, love is essential. Good to hear that. Just in case you missed it, uh, she helpfully expands on the third point, God is technological, like this. We are making God as we are implementing technology that is ever more all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful, and beneficent. Geoethical nanotechnology will ultimately connect all consciousness and control the cosmos. There we are again. We are making God so that we can control the cosmos. Eat the fruit. This is what you get. Same old story. We haven't moved very far. Now, this can all sound very silly, really. And it would be silly 
if these people, as I say, were not so powerful, so influential, so wealthy, and creating the digital networks that we are engaged with, whether we like it or not, every day, and which we increasingly cannot escape from. And as I tried to explain earlier, the technologies that already exist, from the implantable chips to the QR-coded passports to the crude brain interfaces, to the other elements of this rapidly developing internet of things and bodies, all of this is designed to take us into a new artificial world, one created by humans, for humans, in which nature itself will be replaced by a better version created by us. And by the way, when I say humans, I mean a very narrow band of humans, right? The kind of guys who live in the west coast of America. Very modern, very western, mostly very male humans. Not as if the human race as a whole is being consulted here. These people control the way we see the world. They make the technologies we see it through. They're a kind of neo-Gnostic rebellion. They're the open descendants of Tubal Cain. And the rebellion against God and the rebellion against nature, which I think are the same thing. They continue. Now, I wrote a little essay about this recently on my website, and I quoted Zoltan Istvan, and I was interested to see that he somehow found this and started commenting underneath. And he had a conversation with me, and he wanted to explain. He was very keen to explain where he was coming from, why he believed this. So he told me, he laid out the transhumanist philosophy for me. He said this, I'd like to bring your attention to the issue with nature and biology that transhumanists have. It's fundamentally flawed and likely even immoral to perpetuate, given its tendency to predation, disease and death. Simply said, all nature and biology, from plants to wildlife to people, are something to be overcome and totally replaced with the synthetic. No one with even the slightest bit of compassion would create a world like ours, so full of so much suffering. So it must all be undone and remade with technology, justice and equality. Now, it sounds like the kind of thing a 14-year-old boy would come up with. Sorry, my daughter's 14, so that didn't mean, you know, she's, she's a little bit more sophisticated than that, but maybe a 10-year-old. I mean, it really does. It's the kind of thing I used to think was a good idea when I was about that age. But again, if you look at what drives it, it's this reasonable understanding, Nietzschean understanding, actually, that the world is suffering which is also a Christian understanding, which is also a Buddhist understanding, which is humanity. But if you don't have, it seems to me, a sense that there's anything beyond this material plane, then there isn't any logical reason not to try and replace it all with a better version. Although, as I replied to Zoltan Istvan, given that you think humans are fundamentally flawed, why would you want to give them the power to create this new reality? Isn't that likely to make it fundamentally flawed as well? Uh, his answer, by the way, was you might as well give it a go. So, <laughs> filled me with confidence. <laughs> but the more you read this kind of thing, the more you see the human longing for transcendence. The old human longing for transcendence, only this time in a technological form. A universal human desire to connect, to see further, to have something beyond us. But now that we've lost faith in faith, now that God is dead, supposedly then the secular West is seeking that transcendence, seeking God by trying to build him. We could even say everybody has a need for God, whether they know it or not, even Zoltan Istvan. But if they can't believe it, then they build it. Only this time we create God in our image rather than being created in God's image. This is where we're going. And this is where the whole, actually, of the scientific technological project, I think, has been leading. Ultimately, transhumanism. The replacement of nature. C.S. Lewis's abolition of man is the goal. <sighs> On a lighter note, Zoltan also told me of some transhumanist friends he has whose ultimate aim is to 3D print human beings back to life. Okay? So this is, this is exciting. All you need is a tiny little bit of DNA of somebody dead. You can somehow, apparently, theoretically, use 3D printing technology to bring them back to life. Some of his transhumanist friends, he says, have a project to 3D print Jesus back to life so that he can, and I quote, finish his work. I thought he'd finished it already. I, I, I've mentioned to Zoltan that the next time Jesus comes, he might have, want to have a few words with Zoltan and his friends. But 
And there were people actually working on this. To be fair to Zoltan, he did agree that this probably wasn't a good idea. But what we can see here is the outline of the, actually the civil war that Zoltan Isfan talks about. Another way of looking at it is a conflict of values and worldviews about the human future, what it means to be human, what nature is. The Kentucky farmer poet Wendell Berry, in his essay, Life is a Miracle, puts it like this. He says, the next great division of the world will be between people who wish to live as creatures and people who wish to live as machines. Okay, people who wish to live as creatures versus people who wish to live as machines. Another way of putting that is that we're looking at a conflict between those who choose to live within the limits of nature and those who want to break them, and perhaps that's the kind of the human story, the endless dance. Again, right back to the garden. Are you going to live here in community and communion, or are you going to break through the boundaries and see what you can do? Are you going to follow the will of God, or are you going to follow your own will? It's this endless dance that we always have, this conflict all the time. And I think we could say that the whole of the modern Western world, secular world, built as it is on this scientific project of dissecting nature in order to control it, was always going to lead us to this point. Transhumanism is the end point of what we call progress. So I suppose I should probably end, not least because you want your lunch, but I should probably end by asking that hellish question, what, what do we do about this then? I spent most of my life complaining about these things, and then I always get asked what I'm supposed to do about it. And um, the answers are difficult because this situation we find ourselves in is the end of a very long process of development towards this point. If you want to go back to the book of Genesis, which is, what, 3,000 years old at least, then even back then people could see very clearly that the, 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 the conflict here in the human heart is between those who want to follow the will of God as they see it and those who want to become God, those who want to try and live within limits, those who want to break through them. You could argue that the whole of human history is a desire to break through limits all the time from the creation of fire onwards. So in that sense, there's nothing new here. And, and in that sense, also, there's no solution in the sense that we can suddenly change the way, the direction of travel. But we can decide, I think, how we're going to live with it, what we're going to do. Um, so I suppose I'd end by just saying three things that I have in the understanding of how we could see this and how we can make decisions about how to live with it. Because as time goes on, the pressure on us to become more and more involved in more and more wrapped up in this technological machine is going to get more and more serious for us. So I would say three things in my response. I would say, firstly, we have to remember that the opposite of this kind of neo-Gnostic fantasy land that these people are laying out where we upload our minds into the cloud and live forever and 3D print our granddad back to life, the opposite of this is reality because it's fundamentally an unreal project. And if we don't like it, then the alternative is the human body, the woods, the soil, the sky, all of this which is out here now. All of this is happening because whole generations of people are living online, mistaking that life for reality, and the solution to that problem is more reality. The solution to that problem is taking a sledgehammer to your smartphone, which I would strongly recommend. <laughs> Refusing, yeah, <laughs> seriously, do it. Um, there's a, on, on an offside, don't want to, I'll, I'll do the tangent thing since I'm learning it from you. Um, there, there's, there's a technological critic in America called Kirkpatrick Sale, who's been a great neo Luddite for the last 50 years. And back in the 90s, um, he was invited to give a talk at a festival giving his critique of technology. Uh, and he had a, like a 45 minute slot, like me. Uh, instead of preparing a lecture, he had a, a computer put on the stage uh, and then just walked onto the stage with a sledgehammer smashed the computer to pieces, and then just walked off. Which um, has the advantage that you don't have to spend two days preparing the talk. But that's the critique, right? Don't, don't use the phone. Get rid of the phone. Refuse the chips in your skin. Don't ever allow anything like this to happen. See the territory for what it is. Decide where you're going to take your stand. Where are your red lines? What are you not prepared to do? What are you not prepared to do? I don't have a smartphone and I wasn't prepared to have a vaccine passport. And I certainly won't be prepared to have the little mark in my right hand. These are personal choices. Nobody can tell anyone else what to do, but we need to be clear where we're headed. So think about that. Turn it off. Get outside and have a think about where you're going to stand. 
Second response I'd have is, there's really no alternative but to think about the reality that a fake religion has to be countered by a true one. And it is a fake religion. Now you can decide for yourself what that means, but for my part, it seems pretty clear. And this is the answer maybe to Nietzsche's inquiry. If you don't turn towards God, you get turned in the opposite direction. And uh, I don't know about you, but I think the silicon transcendence on offer has a distinctly Luciferian whiff. I think I can tell where Antichrist is going to come from. Silicon Valley, through the networks. Finally, just remember one last thing, if you want a little hopeful note to end on, which is that the transhumanist wager, which is what Zoltan Istvan calls this process, this process of pursuing transcendence, the breaking of all the limits, ultimately it fails. And it fails because some limits can't be broken. Right? God is not mocked. But nature isn't mocked either. There are planetary boundaries. They can be measured, actually. One thing the scientific project can be used for, crudely at least, is to measure the limits by which nature can't be pushed any further. The changing climate is the breaking of a planetary boundary. If you take too many forests away, it's impossible for the natural world to sustain itself in the same way. What we've already done to the climate, the amount of stuff we've put up there, is going to radically shift everything in ways we can't predict even without computer models. Fundamentally, the attempt to replace the whole of nature with something synthetic when you don't even understand nature, when you don't even understand your own heart, is going to fail. Honestly, I mean, we can't even, most of us can't even run our own household, let alone run the whole world or build a new one. It doesn't work. The desire to conquer death and to remake the whole world is a kind of digital teenage fantasy, the kind that you need to create if you're looking into that Nietzschean void, I think. Because you say what you like about Nietzsche, but he was critically honest, actually, about what happens when God is dead. What you have to look into, that meaninglessness. And the transhumanist wager is a way of trying to get out of that again. To say, okay, well, obviously there's nothing but this swirling material void of meaningless atoms, but hey, we can live forever in it. We can control it ourselves. I mean, it gives you something to do, doesn't it? But while the pursuit of this is causing, it will cause damage. It will fail. It will fail. So maybe our choice about how we respond to this is part of the challenge of being here in this time. Maybe it's what we were put here for. That choice, how far do we go? How do we respond? If we're Christian, if we're religious, if we just reject this for other reasons, how do we say it? How do we speak it? What do we do? We have to do something. But in the meantime, finally, that decision that Wendell Berry put before us is the one we have to make. Are we going to live as creatures or are we going to live as machines? And that's um, a question you can ponder over lunch. Thank you. <laughs>